So good afternoon. Um, so this is the third day, and I suspect many of you feel that your brains are rapidly filling up with thoughts and ideas, and you're desperately re requiring a decompression phase, and the last thing you want to see on the last afternoon is detailed compositional statistics, but here we are. Um, so before we get started with that, though, I wanted to ask if there's any sort of concepts that over the last couple of days have come up that you really, really, really wanted to ask a question about that you haven't had the chance to do yet. <clears throat> Could be anything. I can't promise I can answer it, but if you have questions about OTUs or um, things that aren't OTUs or stuff that John said this morning or whatever. Yeah, Fiona. Just a comment. That's a great point. And maybe also Set aside a little bit of time, just you might want to think about questions that come up, and uh, then we can sort of have a little bit of a discussion about those chats and shoes. Because the survey is supposed to take a half an hour to really get the chat out. Um, <clears throat> just as a last sort of stalling tactic, how many of you are coming out um, <laughs> more excited about metagenomics from this be before my lecture? <laughs> Excellent. Okay, good, good, good. Because, um, you know, we try to strike the right balance of enthusiasm and skepticism. And at one point, I had a very smart student in my class say, is bioinformatics good for anything? So <laughs> I'm glad that we're sort of, we're, we're not in that space. Um, and hopefully, you've been able to become as excited about this stuff as we are. So let's get moving. So we're going to talk about fancy statistical stuff. So. What I'm hoping we can get through in the next uh, two hours, I suppose, between the lecture and the um, workshop, that's what it's called. I'm going to blame the goat curry on any pauses or misstatements. Uh, learning objectives. So Will sort of did a brief introduction of some statistical tools. And actually, uh, not to shortchange John, I believe he talked about some this morning as well. Briefly. Briefly. Briefly, OK. Um, you will be able to, or else. What's that? Oh, you've set me up. Very good. Excellent. Uh, so formulate important questions about metagenomic data. Well, hopefully you're sort of on that path. There were lots of very interesting topics that came up as we went around the room on the first morning. Understand why compositionality matters. Right? Uh, choose an appropriate test given the types of questions asked. And I want to emphasize here that I can sort of give you the 20,000 foot view of this, but there are, there's an obscene number of different statistical tests. There's more than you can shake a stick at. And anybody who's taken like a biostatistics or multivariate statistics course, or even just tried to look at different distance measures for uh, you know, uh, microbial community data, will appreciate that we can't run through everything um, in a realistic amount of time. But just some of the principles, right? It's really the principles that matter. And then in two years, once everything that's been used now has been replaced by other stuff, then uh, you'll be able to say, okay, well, I understand what people are trying to do, at least. <clears throat> Even if you're not, like, reading all the formulas in the supplementary material. Uh, and interpret the results. Okay, so we're going to take a little bit of a look in the tutorial at um, interpreting some results. Right? And then, in very general terms, how can machine learning methods uh, be applied to metagenomic data? How many of you have used machine learning methods before? Okay, a few of you. Um, what's your favorite machine learning method? What have you used? Lasso regression? Nice, that's a good one. That's like the, I don't want to go full on random forest or SVM, I'm going to do a little bit of machine learning. Yeah, yeah, cool, that's a good one. Okay, so again, <clears throat> not a super detailed introduction to machine learning methods, just enough to say, here's what they are. Let's sort of naively use one. Now I've made you dangerous. Go do some analysis. Um, and there's this. I have 65 slides, and I go on tangents. So you know, I'm happy to answer any questions about stuff we get through or do not get through in this lecture. Um, and hopefully, at the very least, if we skip over some of the more tedious stuff, or less tedious stuff, then uh, you'll at least have the reference to look at and say, OK, well, this is what he was going to talk about if he had better time management. So 
one of the things, and this is sort of interesting historically, right, <clears throat> from the point of view of, uh, <clears throat> so there's a bit of a story. The Human Microbiome Project, right, started in 2007, 2008, something like that. Um, and there's this great story of a conference call, uh, which is how all great scientific stories start. And it had about 200 people on it. And, you know, all of the, the principals of the HMP, you know, Curtis Hutton, Howard, Dirk Gavers, um, uh, and so on. And Rob Knight was on the call. Of course, Rob Knight, uh, architect of time and many other things. And <laughs> so I'm told, I wasn't on this call. Uh, at some point, Rob said, so what's the hypothesis? And there was apparently a minute of silence. None of the other 199 people had an answer to that. However, the key here is that, yes, there is some exploratory analysis to be done in metagenomes, right? Part of this, we're still at a phase where it's like, what the heck is there, right? We needed a reference for a bunch of healthy humans from St. Louis and Boulder, Colorado, in order to compare all of our other subjects against, right? Without that, without some sort of reference that's just collected, as Ernst Rutherford would say, stamp collecting, right? Then we wouldn't really have anything to go on. So it's, you know, if you're collecting data without necessarily a hypothesis in mind, that's okay. That's what exploratory data analysis is for. But if you have a hypothesis or a hypothesis emerges from your analysis, then, uh, you know, you can say, well, what exactly are the predictions of the hypothesis uh, now that I've seen the results? Uh, and how do we properly test that, right? Now, I'm not going to get into the details of you know, Karl Popper and statistics and things like that. But, you know, there's basically hypothesis testing and exploratory, right? And so microbial communities are awesome because they break statistics. It's kind of like the story of 100 years ago when a lot of statistical methods were developed because the ecologists were like, look, it's messy. So now we're looking at the same thing for microbial communities and things like, you know, the distribution of abundances across all of your samples is typically pretty wacky. Right? And so, uh, you know, it could be like this sort of gamma distributed, negative binomial, whatever, and there's a ton of zeros, right? It's like you look at OTU number 657, it's like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, right? And that makes statistics harder, right? So that's something to worry about. Uh, this, is, <clears throat> this is the biggie, and we're going to spend a bit of time on this, and so John apparently talked about this a little bit this morning. Uh, the whole point that we're looking at proportions rather than counts which causes um, pain. And the big problem is that sometimes people don't realize that it's causing pain and they just proceed uh, without feeling the pain and that's not necessarily a good thing. My favorite part of this whole story, my favorite part of metagenomics, microbial community analysis, is the hierarchies, right? Which might be a weird thing to say, but the, you know, the key to it, and you'll see this in the machine learning example that I'm gonna show you later on, is that we can think about things in a hierarchical context, right? It's like, what's the species, right? It's E. coli, right? Well, within E. coli, we have a number of strains and isolates and subdivisions and blah, blah, blah. And so if you're trying to say, well, what really matters here? What makes the difference between, you know, a healthy tuna and a sick tuna? Well, maybe it's not the name species E. coli. Maybe you have to dig further down, looking at 16S or metagenomic functions or, uh, you know, even just some sort of phylogenetic representation in order to get the right view of this. And this is exciting stuff, and it's true. Phylogenetic, functional, taxonomic, this is where some of the really, really, really interesting questions lie. Okay? Which is not to say that you need to explicitly address them. I mean, there's only a certain amount of things you can do, but it's certainly fun to think about, even if you're not going to spend a huge amount of time on it. And so just to give a quick overview, um, if we want about, you know, statistical methods, parametric methods sort of using uh, inference of distributions, assumptions of distributions to look for, um, you know, significant differences. Uh, and we can think also in terms of how we're trying to infer relationships between things. And <clears throat> sort of a classic distinction in uh, statistical learning, machine learning, whatever you want to call it, is between unsupervised and supervised methods, right? And so supervised methods are really cool because you're basically just saying data, you know, what looks like what, essentially. You don't have any preconceived notion. In fact, it's rather a lie. Well, it's not a lie, but, you know, here's, here's um, a bunch of dots, right? 
and the dots are red and green, and that was a terrible choice of colors for which I apologize. The dots are red and green, but the key here is that the inference of whatever structure that is was done without reference to the redness and the greenness. It's just like, dear method, here's a bunch of points, make them into clusters or higher order manifolds, whatever, and once you've got that, then you can overlay your points and say, well, what came out of that, right? And principal coordinate analysis is a great example of that. You don't go to PCOA, well, actually, um, normally you don't go to, um, this, this is going on the web, isn't it, Anne? Okay, well, whatever, I'll say it anyway. Um, so normally with PCOA or PCA or whatever, non-metric multidimensional scaling, you're not saying, fit me a beautiful ordination plot that maximizes the separation between my groups. That's the opposite of what you're supposed to do, except if you're publishing a very um, prominent paper and um, use certain methods that are very similar to PCOA, but do really try very hard to separate the groups from one another. And that's all I'm going to say about that, especially in sort of a recording context. You can ask me about it later. Um, so the other, the other component to it is the supervised learning, right? That's where you have some notion of, you know, this is this and that is that, right? And you're asking the question, whether it's a complex classifier, a simple one or whatever, what are the rules that I can find in order to differentiate the tacos from the moons, right? What are the properties that are really important there? Except that instead of an obvious problem like, you know, tacos and, and moons, you're really got, you've got like really subtle patterns in hundreds of ASVs or thousands of OTUs, right? And so the classifier has to kind of go, mm, let's try this, no, nah, let's try this, so that's a bit better, right? Do, 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 until it finds a satisfying result or you just give up, right? So that's the classes, two or more discrete classes. Contrast that with regression, like lasso regression, for example, or um, not binomial, whatever it's called, regression. Sorry? Logistic regression. Thank you. Yes, that's it. Um, and so basically you have a model and you're trying to come up with uh, qual um, quantitative predictions, right? So that's the contrast, classification of regression. There's also semi-supervised methods, which are both involving inference of distributions, inference of relationships, in addition to certain classification-based approaches. Um, so those exist. Uh, I don't know if they've really come into play in metagenomics or not. And no one else is volunteering. So I don't know. Anyway, it's sort of, you can see that it's sort of a trade-off. And so I just wanted to do a brief introduction to compositionality, right? What is it and what sort of problems does it lead to? And so um, I thought we'd step away from bacteria for a moment and really talk about cattle. Okay? And so, so here's, here's you know, traditional ecology of multicellular overly complex organisms where you've got two different samples, right? Two different populations, in fact. And the population of this is 10 cows, three of which are red, seven of which are white. Uh, and over here we have 30 cows, three of which are red and 27 of which are white, right? And so obviously, obviously, the number of red cows is the same in the two samples, right? But the proportion is quite different, right? Three-tenths versus um, one-tenth. So, you know, this, and then you say to yourself, okay, well, what really matters here, right? Is it the fact that I have at least three red cows in these samples? Maybe there's a threshold number of red cows and there's like an ecosystem shift. And it doesn't matter how many white cows or whatever. Maybe it's the proportion, right? A greater abundance of red cows leads to some desirable or undesirable ecological outcome, right? And so same count, different proportion. The obvious contrast to that is we have three red cows on the left, nine red cows on the right. And so now we have the same proportion, but different counts, okay? So obviously looking at a different question here. But what happens in, let's say you can only count to 10, right? Um, or in the case of DNA sequencing, you can only count to 50 million or whatever device you're using, right? Then you are subsampling, right? And instead of getting an enumeration of the population, you are getting a sample. Right? And once you've done that, you have no freaking clue unless you've done some independent method like cell sorting or 
microscopy or something like that, that in fact there are three times as many cows in the population on the right as there are on the left. And guess what? The number of cows can actually matter a great deal, right? You don't know if it's actually the same number of cows or just the same proportion of cows, right? And if it's different proportions of cows, you don't know if it's the same number of cows. These are not knowable things. And this really, really, really messes up with your statistics. And the additional thing is that different subsamples will have different associated variances. So the impact of subsampling can be uh, important. And one of the keys to a lot of methods is actually trying to model the variance of your subsamples, either through some sort of simulation approach, like um, or sampling approach, like uh, Aldex. Is it Aldex? No, I'm thinking of, yeah, Aldex. OK, Aldex 2. Um, or doing something else to try and capture this element of, of variation that can be quite important, right? It's like you're doing an ANOVA or a t-test, right? The difference between means is six. Is it statistically significant? Well, if the variance of each sample is two, then yes, it is. If the variance of each sample is 165,000, then no, it isn't, right? These are things you need to consider here as well. So sequencing, right? Unless there are fewer nucleotides in our sample than we can assess in a sequencing run, so there's like three E. coli in our sample, except that we do amplification anyway, so we're always going to be limited by our sequencing, sequencing capacity. Right? So that's an issue. And so what does this mean? Well, this is a, this is a figure from a really phenomenal paper by uh, Greg Gluer at Western University who's developed or contributed to a lot of these methods to try and deal with compositionality. And the table is basically split in two. Well, there's the labels there, split in three, but two important parts. And essentially, you go through this list of things that may in some cases be very familiar, right? Rarefaction, which was quite widely used for a while, is bad for many reasons. Um, and so DC addresses some of those. And then your distance measures, the same ones that pretty much everybody still uses, right? Um, you know, Ray Curtis, Unifrac, uh, Jensen Shannon, Jacquard distance, Phylosaur, um, you know, what else? Does anyone else have a favorite um, distance method that's not listed here? What's that? Euclidean. Euclidean distance, okay, that's another one. Yeah, you can use Euclidean. They all suffer from certain limitations, right? Ordination, PCOA, obviously, you know, <clears throat> the Differences, the important differences in a sample may not depend on the relative abundance of things that are different. Right? So it's like, you're 40% E. coli, you're 80% E. coli, who cares? What really matters is the 2% of acromansia here and the 3% over there. Right? PicoA is going to be like, I don't care about that. Right? Or it's going to bury it down in like your fifth or sixth component with an eigenvalue of who cares. And so that's really important. Uh, multivariate comparisons, so that's kind of your standard ANOVAs or analysis of similarity or permanova. Uh, correlations, so we all know and love Pearson and Spearman, right? Do I want to do parametric, do I want to do non-parametric, whatever. Uh, and then these differential abundance methods that people want to use to say, you know, do I have different amounts of this over here and that over there, right? And so, on the other hand, uh, this is the slide between the one I just had and the other hand. Um, one thing I want to emphasize before we start talking about compositionality, and it's an interesting one, and it applies to pretty much everything in science, right, and in life in general, is here is the best way to do it, right? Here is what everybody does, and here somewhere between is what you're capable of if you know what you're doing, right? And so I want to emphasize that using methods, you'll see the impact of using methods that do not account for compositionality, right? In some cases it matters very little, in some cases it matters a lot. What I want to say about this is that do not dismiss a result simply because they used a relatively naive approach. And spoiler alert, the first part of the tutorial is going to be using an ANOVA that does not account for compositionality. I'm trying to communicate the intuition to you, and then you can go out and use other methods um, that are based on log ratio transforms, for example. So again, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And you'll see some examples where, in some cases, it makes very little difference. In another case, it makes all the difference in the world. And depending on which of those elements in the table we're talking about, this awareness has arisen or has been translated to different degrees. 
And so if we want to talk about, for example, rarefaction, well, rarefaction is, you know, it's the longest four-letter word in metagenomics. Don't do it. Uh, distance is used. I mean, there are a couple of um, compositionally aware distance methods that have just come out in the last year or two, but everybody and their freaking dog still uses Bray Curtis and weighted unifrac and unweighted unifrac and blah, blah, blah. So, and that's, you know, it's still okay, right? It's still okay. Uh, and then correlation analysis, uh, in part because of historical reasons, earlier publication of methods that take compositionality into account, those are generally more sophisticated and kind of more with it in terms of the acknowledgement and the application. Statisticians have known about compositionality for decades, right? Some of the methods that have been adopted into this are from like 1980, right? 1981. So it's nothing new. But as with any new field, it's like there's sort of the first methods that come out and it's like, that's wrong. And so people come up with other methods and it's like, well, that's wrong. And so, you know, we're sort of in that phase of, I would say, rapid progress. John, would you say rapid progress? No. Okay. <laughs> all right. We're all learning here. Um, change, change, rapid change. There we go. Um, and, you know, there've been some papers to say, standard approaches versus compositionally aware approaches, you know, the impact really depends on the structure of the data, right? There are results that are like Captain Obvious, right? This is 80% acromanzia and this is 2% acromanzia, right? And it's two, sa two sets of samples. Is that significant? Yes. Did you use a composition? Did you use a standard method? No. Does it matter? Not so much. Your effect size might change a bit. Your p-value might change a bit, but from a biological context, you know, you're good. So I'm not trying to say, you know, just use the standard approaches. Uh, I'm not giving you an excuse or an out. I'm just saying that there is still some validity to, to think about when you use them. And the best practices are evolving. And so what this comes down to is what your reviewers say, right? You're like, you submit it and they're like, why did you use ANOVA? Reject. Right. So that's kind of, you know, depending on who you get, they will apply different uh, levels of stringency to the analysis. Okay, so we have on the left all of these standard approaches, and on the right we have some compositional, compositionally aware equivalents. Uh, and Will pointed this out in, this, in a slide, and I think this is coming up in a couple of slides. You talk about compositional approaches, it's a bit ambiguous, right? Because the compositional approach is either something that's aware or not aware of composition. In this case, the compositional approach means, hey, look, it's composition. Let's do something about it. Right? So I just wanted to, to make that unambiguous in case I accidentally um, you know, stray off course of it. And so I'm not going to talk about all of these things, but I wanted to talk about, um, and I assume that this is just a typo in the paper, that per ANOVA is the same as per MANOVA. Um, because they're both, I mean, they're permutation based, and I think they both kind of address this issue. Actually, they're not both, I think they're the same thing. Uh, correlation methods, we got Pearson, uh, Spearman based, and we've got Spark, Speak Easy, and various other Greek letters. There's actually a really good paper, which I cite in a few slides, that compares like a zillion of these things and really illustrates the ability to detect different types of ecological associations on real and simulated data. And then just a little bit on uh, laser pointer. What's the no point to laser pointer? Can point right there. Um, differential abundance. So some of you have probably used LEFC, which came out of Curtis, Curtis Huttenhauer's lab, and actually is a Norwegian pastry, which I didn't know. Uh, and on the other side, ALDEX2, right, which is a more compositionally aware method for inferring differential abundance. Okay. Any questions? Where we pause to take a sort of mental break. Any any questions so far? All right. In the previous slide, the Spearman row was on the left, but the row characters on the right. So those are two different approaches. Uh, I th I assume. I don't actually know what the row is referring there to there, right? I mean, I'm like, okay, Spark can speak easier. We're good. Phi, you know, so. And again, I said, like it's like I said, it's a subset of methods that they tested out in this 2016. Uh, who was the first author? It was like a zillion authors, and it was all the creators of the different methods. So that's where I would look for clarity on that. Uh, Spark is nice and straightforward in some ways, and I'm going to kind of touch on it, hopefully at an appropriate level of resolution. All right. 
Simple things first. Okay. Questions you can ask of your data. Easy questions you can ask of your data. Are there two categories or greater than two categories? Okay. Um, and depending on that, you choose either the left column or the right column. And then you ask yourself the question, well, um, okay, what is the key to a parametric method? I'm asking you. Parameters. What's that? Parameters. parameters, distributional parameters. Yes, yeah, exactly. And so a parametric method will look at your data, try to infer a particular probability distribution with certain parameters to it, and then use that sort of mapping to a probability distribution to actually test whether the differences between whatever are significant. Right? A non-parametric test or a permutation-based test doesn't do that. They just kind of work with the data themselves and muck around with the data to try and see if we can get uh, some result that's impressive relative to no signal. Right? So it's kind of like, here's my data, and here's the difference between my data. Right? If I shake up the data such that it's completely randomized, do I still see a difference that's like as good as that or better? Right? That's the notion, that's the idea behind a p-value. Another way of thinking about it is simply our differences between groups, you know, um, healthy pigs, sick pigs, significantly greater than differences within groups, right? So there's a whole range of methods there, and there's PermaNova. And so ANOVA, to start with something very basic, very simple, it's parametric, which is both a good thing and a bad thing. Why is it a good thing? Right, so I fly out tonight, and I only do carry-on luggage. And so I have a bunch of Diet Coke left, and this is the cherry flavor, which is quite good. I know, I know some people are really put off by aspartame, but if you answer this question, I'll give you a can of Coke, Diet Coke. So why are parametric methods good? Does nobody like aspartame in the room? <laughs> Somebody, anybody. <sighs> fine, fine. By fitting your data to a statistical distribution, you potentially gain more power to infer statistically significant effects because you're not so much limited by the number of samples you have. You've mapped them into some sort of space where you effectively have an infinite number of samples. Okay. Why is it a bad thing? Okay. Why are parametric methods potentially bad? Oh dear God. Um, <laughs> absolutely. That's absolutely correct. So, I mean, feel free to re gift this. <laughs> you are 100% right. And this is why when you do a regression, when you do a NOVA or whatever. Sorry. I said there's. Uh, there's assumptions, distributional assumptions, et cetera, that are often disregarded. Exactly. Yeah. So depending on the method you use, there are assumptions because you're fitting to a distribution. The data, you look at the data, it's like, does it make sense to fit to that distribution? Right. And so that's where you get things like the assumption of normality in a t-test. Right. You're fitting a normal distribution. Are the data, do the data seem to be normally distributed? Often what happens in, in sort of bioinformatics is like I have 16 million observations and the t-test is robust with respect to violations of assumptions if I have a lot of data. So forget it. I don't need to do it. So that's kind of okay, but the, the you know the the testing of these assumptions is often neglected, right? And the key to ANOVA is simply is the sum of squared differences between groups significantly larger than the sum of squared differences between groups. And the key to ANOVA, I mean, a t test is two samples, right? Like, is there a significant difference or not? If there is. It's pretty obvious which two groups are significantly different from each other, the ones you just tested. ANOVA, though, can tell you if a difference exists, but not where. ANOVA just looks at all of the groups and says, there's something here. Um, but the whole point, the reason you can't do too many, like, just complete t-tests is this uh, non-independence of those t-tests. So you do ANOVA, and you say, is there a difference or not? If there's no difference, you're like, well, I guess we're done here. If there is a difference, you have to actually go on and do post hoc tests, such as Tukey's test, in order to say which groups are, in fact, different from one another. Right? So that's a very important point. And this is something you will see when we use STEMP. 
And then there's other, there's tons of variants. It's ridiculous. I saw one this morning that I'd never heard of before, but I can't remember the name of it. MANOVA is, is used for multivariate responses when you have multiple output variables that may in fact have some correlation structure. Kreskel Wallace is the non parametric answer to ANOVA. How am I doing for time? What time is it? What time is it? Okay. All right, 20. <laughs> um, okay. Kreskel Wallace, you don't use the actual data points, you rank them, right? And so you get away from this whole dis excuse me, distributional thing. And then it's like, are the ranks, you know, is the centroid of ranks over here different from the centroid of ranks over there? That, that part is similar to ANOVA. But again, if you get a significant result from Kruskal Wallace, you again need to run post hoc tests to say, well, these ones are actually different from each other. Permanova is really cool. Um, it's sort of the complete abandonment of any notion of fitting things to anything at all. Permutation tests, many of you are certainly are probably familiar with them, is, as I just said before, take your data, which is like category A, category B, category C, and test for an effect size, right? It's like, oh, the difference between, let's keep it simple, two samples. The difference between means between sample A and sample B is 12, okay? 12, great. Is that significant? Is it important? Um, you know, how do we assess that? Well, we can use those other methods. But the other thing you can do is take your data points, randomly shuffle them between categories, when you do that, you should have no differences at all between the two categories because you've just mucked up whatever pattern you had. So you do this once and you calculate the same difference and you get six. Okay, well, six is less than 12. That's great. It's promising. But obviously, you need to do it more than once. And so you do it 100 times or 1,000 times and it's like six, five, two, three, four, 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 five, you know. And so 12 is really outside of that distribution. So then 12 is impressive. But if you do these reshufflings a bunch of times and you get like 10 and 15 and 6 and 53 and a 12 is not looking so impressive. And so that's where you get the p-value from a permutation test. One of the really cool things about permanova is that you are not constrained to look at the difference between means or medians, right? You can have any sort of measure you want that you can calculate from your data and you just permute, 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 calculate the same measure and you get your distribution, you get your p-value, okay? So that's a really nice thing about it. And as a consequence, it can accommodate both, you know, fun statistics, uh, more interesting than the mean, and also fancy experimental designs. Okay, so that's useful. All right. So, differential abundance. Right? Key question here is what features? And features can be amplicon sequence variants and OTUs and species, whatever that means, and pathways and functions and metabolic networks and what else? What else can we do? Phylogenetic clades? Anything else? Uh, are different between two or more samples, right? So this is where we really want to get into the gory details of what, if anything, really differentiates these samples, right? And this is where it comes back to you may have a hypothesis, in which case you say, I'm going to test these things specifically carbohydrate active enzymes, the abundance of acromanzia, whatever, or it's a fishing expedition, you're like, well, there's 360 ASVs, and let's look at all of them, right? Which is fine, there's no problem with that. Um, it's useful for identifying good guys or bad guys, key functional genes or biomarkers. Now, good guys and bad guys is a value judgment, right? Um, also, they're gender neutral, but the point is that even seeing something that's overrepresented in one set relative to another, right, if you've got your healthy individuals and your individuals afflicted with malaise, boredom, whatever, it doesn't mean that those are causal, right? You, you make your inferences, but I mean bioinformatics is all about generating hypotheses, right? You say, oh, I see this as a difference, and maybe I know something functionally about these things, therefore my hypothesis is that this is actually important. To test that hypothesis uh, rigorously, you need to do experiments, right? Which we don't do, but at least we can sort of sort through the, you know, the uh, the actual data and say, well, here are some possibilities. Wave our hands a bit about this pathway seems to matter, whatever. Um, 
And if you're not familiar with, sometimes they're called pathobionts and sometimes they're called synergens, uh, you should really read about them because they're neat. These are things that kind of hang around normally. They're part of the normal microflora, you know, normal, whatever that means. Uh, but in the presence of bad influences, like let's say certain strains of Pseudomonas, they jump on the, you know, the sort of the, the wagon of being pathogens, right? And so this whole thing about good guys or bad guys can also be conditional in the context, right? All right. So this is a neat method that came out a few years ago from uh, the lab of Kurt Hussen, Curtis Huttenhauer. How many of you have used LAFC before? Yep. Um, so it's, it's slightly complicated, but it generates really interesting visualizations. Um, unfortunately, it does fall into that standard hierarchy, but nonetheless, it does other things really well. So it's kind of a, you know, what, what should I be doing here, right? At least it's worth considering. And so left C does something important. It wants to find groupings, and we'll see more about groupings in a moment, that distinguish two categories of samples based on effect size. Because it's not all about the p-values, right? You can get a p-value of 10 to the minus 9 for a bacterium that's present in 0.1% of this sample, that this type of sample, and 0.1001% of the other type of sample, right? Yay, that's really impressive, thanks. So LEFC really gives, you know, really places an emphasis. There's statistical testing along the way, but it really looks at the effect size and presents the effect size rather than really uh, obsessing over the p-value. The thing that's really good about LEFC is that it explicitly considers hierarchical relationships in the data, specifically phylogenetic groupings. So how does LEFC work? Well, it's kind of complicated, but let's see if we can uh, work our way through this. So I've, I've broken it down into three steps. What we have here are a number of different samples. So the columns are samples, okay? Poo samples or lung samples or soil samples, whatever, columns. These are grouped into classes, right? So class one is samples of a particular type. Class two is samples of a particular type. And then you can have subclasses as well. Uh, and then you have features, right? So these could be different uh, types of um, functions, groups, whatever. And so the first step is to actually do this non-parametric Kruskal-Wallis test for each of these different features. So say, okay, well, here's where we look, right? At the top, again, I don't know why people default to red and green. It's really, um, it's, it's so weird. Uh, but in any case, um, the point of the top one is that you know, there's no at least visible tendencies that are strong, right? So there will be probably a difference between means, between the two, but it's not going to be particularly impressive because we have red on both sides, we've got green on both sides. Okay. And so what you see in this column here are the different conceptual p-values coming out of each of these features, right? So top one's 0.13, and second one's 0.01, and intuitively, you know, you see reds on the left and greens on the right. Okay, I get it. Uh, and so on and so forth. And the, the fourth one down, 0, 0.00, because we got bright green on the left and bright red on the right. right. Yes. And so that's okay. And so your first filter are these p-values from the Kruskal Wallace. Okay. The second step is to do a Wilcoxon rank sum test, looking at differences between different uh, subsets of features. And now we could be thinking about different types of things like phylogenetic clades. Okay, and so we run the Wilcoxon test on these subclasses uh, for the ones that were significant in the first step. And now we get a second set of results. And some of them are interesting and some of them are not. Okay? This then gets translated into an effect size using something called linear discriminant analysis. The point of LDA is to say we have a distribution of frequencies or abundances or whatever. Um, can we actually differentiate them using a simple function, right? And the extent to which you can do this is <clears throat> mapped into this uh, range, essentially, um, looking at your two original classes, right? And so, if you can differentiate, uh, if you can differentiate them really well, well, maybe it's higher in class one, um, in which case it's colored green, and maybe it's a lot higher in class two, in which case it's colored red. And so we're looking at significant differences 
and we're mapping them to these subclasses so that we can consider things like nested phylogenetic clades, which gives you something like this. Okay. And so we have a phylogenetic tree here, and it's sort of it's collapsed, and I think it's collapsed maybe for the sake of, the sake of tractability, so that you're testing, like you know, if there's <clears throat> 200 uh, leaves, you don't necessarily want to test all. 198 uh, internal nodes on a rooted phylogenetic tree. So you can collapse things where you're maybe warranted to do so. And then you have these tests applied to each of these different clades. And so now here we are. You're not just saying OTUs, right? It's not OTUs. You're not looking at ASVs. You're not using species, which is good. You're actually looking at many possible nested features and trying to say which ones are most impressive. And so looking at this, you start to get a sense of you know, where these differences exist uh, and looking at the different uh, taxonomic groups. So bifidobacterium is much more highly abundant in uh, one type of mouse. And it was an interesting test. It's basically looking at uh, the uh, mutants that are <clears throat> have different degrees of susceptibility to colon cancer. The point is that there are two groups. And in one group, there's a much higher abundance of certain types of firmicutes, and you can see with color intensity that certain specific clades are really, really differentially abundant. Okay. Which leads to the question why, but that's a whole other, you know, different analysis. Maybe you have pie crust, you're on pie crust, you're like, well, these functions are different, right? But at least you get this nice visualization and a sense of which clades are different, and looking at named species, you can get that as well. But LEFC doesn't handle compositional data appropriately. It's based on proportions. And so the key to a lot of this, and again, John, I don't know if you talked about this at all, uh, log ratio transforms, OK? What's that? Well, you can have it if you want. I, I, can, I can take a break and, and kind of. Uh, digest the lamb curry a bit more, goat curry, sorry. Um, and so, you know, there's a couple of things to think about. Proportions, as I said, don't really tell you much about quantities, right? You don't have that information, right? So that's, you know, proportional differences across samples may not actually be that informative. But the, the primary way to deal with compositionality is actually not to look at absolute proportions, but to look at ratios between your different taxa. So you're not initially looking at, you know, bifidobacterium is 40%, 60%, 30%, 20%, 0%. The first thing you're doing is internal to each sample, you're calibrating bifidobacterium and everything else to the abundance of the other things. Is that fair, John? Is that a good, uh, yeah? OK, cool. <laughs> he, he knows this stuff pretty well. So, um, so really, you do that calibration first within each sample, the idea being that if you can have some sort of standard that you calibrate against, then what? Sorry. If you have a standard that you calibrate against, that can give you a more robust approach that is resilient to the effects of compositionality. And so let's do something about this. And the thing that people generally do is what's called the log ratio transformation. Okay? And this is interesting and it has a couple of nice effects to it. And so the key to log ratio transformations, well, it's a ratio. Therefore, you're dividing something by something else. What is the numerator? Well, it's the abundances of each of the things in your samples. What's the denominator? What are you dividing by? Any guesses? It's in the slides, right? Um, there's a couple of things you can do. In fact, there's multiple things you can do from really simple to really, really complicated. But one thing you can do is magic invariant feature. Okay? So I know that there are always this many E. coli in my sample, right? Well, that's nice. Then you can calibrate by dividing by that particular species. Right? It's OTU, function, whatever. You've got that calibration point. I don't even need to ask what the problem is, right? 
how do you ever know that? And it's never true. So that's not this, this sort of what's called the additive log ratio is not really an effective approach. OK, another one that people use, and this is actually the most widely used one, is dividing by the geometric mean of the taxa to give you the centered log ratio. OK, so this is not placing the emphasis on one magic thing in each of your samples. It's based on the overall distribution of things in each of your samples. Right? So you're going to take bar chart or bar from sample number one and divide the abundance of everything in that bar chart by an aggregate measure of the abundances of everything in that bar chart. And it just so happens that using this geometric mean gives you some really nice properties. So that's the ratio. And then you take the log, uh, which gives you a different distribution of your abundances, right? And so actually, you know, things with really high ratios get scaled down relative to the things with lower ratios. OK, so Aldex 2. And this is like the lightning round, because I'm not spending a huge amount of time on this. But um, do I even want to? Let's see. Uh, sure, why not? So start with your counts, right? Your, your counts of OTUs or ASVs or species or whatever. And the first thing you want to do, you know, that, you know in advance that you're going to take a logarithm. And you know that a lot of things are going to be 0. We already addressed that. So you don't want to take the log of 0, because that crashes your software. And so add 0.5. And this is, this is Greg Gluer's method, right? Like, I think he actually came up with this, yeah? Yeah, so this is Greg Gluer's method. So add a tiny number, a tiny amount, 0.5, just to fudge the fact that the log of 0 is awkward. And then, and this is really important, you get your, your counts, and you actually sample from them. So you're not just taking your actual counts, you're sampling from them using this, this Bayesian approach, because by sampling, you get an estimate of the variance of your sample and a sense of how unstable your estimates are, which is really important. What do you do after that? Then you do the magic centered log ratio transform, which gives you these nice properties that I talked about before. Once you've got that, then you can go to town with your statistical tests, right? In particular, Aldex2 does a couple, right? Welch's T and the Wilcoxon rank, a couple different types of standard statistical tests. And then, very important, and hopefully most or all of you know this, if you're doing 16 billion different tests of significance, one of them is going to give you a really impressive p-value for no particular reason. So multiple test corrections, right? How many of you use the Bonferroni? Okay. How many of you use something better than the Bonferroni? <laughs> he raised his hand sheepishly. What do you use? Not correcting. <laughs> Bonferroni is great if you want to be really, really, really conservative, right? It's like I divide by this very large number to get very, um, yeah. Well, sorry. Rate, um, experimenting yeah, yeah. So like a story FDR, for example, or a done CDOC or something like that. Yeah. So there's a bunch of different options, and actually you'll see in Stamp the software um, from Donovan Parks that there's a range of options for multiple test correction, including Bonferroni, which is like a warm hug for many people, but also including other methods that are a bit more, you know, well suited to the multiple test problem. Fiona. I want to comment on the Benjamin Oxford is another one of these. Um, where you can get uh, Benjamin Oxford, yeah, so it's in Stamp. It's another FDR, right? I think it's a, what's that? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I think it was the first one I learned in, in biostatistics. <coughs> I forget how it works. What's the formula? Well, it's, just, it's more just um, it's that issue, I think, of Bonferroni being so conservative, right? That some of these other methods are examples of ones that we apply in our Bonferroni schools. Yes. Quite as bad. And personally, I like the idea of trying new and seeing what you get. Uh, you know, because in the end, like you say, I'm correct. Yeah. I mean, oh my god, I forget the Benjamini formula. Of this, I think it's the story FDR that was published in PNAS maybe 10 or 15 years ago now. And what's really cool about that false discovery rate is that it kind of looks at, you know, under the null hypothesis, you expect an even distribution of p-values from 0 to 1, right? 
the story FDR basically says, what's the expected distribution? It tries to estimate that from all of the different bars in your graph. And then it says, well, at this end, right, the significant end, do we see some sort of spike? Right? And it corrects for that. So it's, it's a really nice method. And I think, is it more widely used than Benjamini? I think it is, but it's, I can't. Um, use a formula i over n, where i is the individual's p-value, and then you have the uh, is it is q an exponent, or is it i over m times q? Q is an exponent. Well, er, <laughs> I don't. I do not remember what the formula is. Okay. Because I think it's it's. So there's no exponentiation. Oh, then what am I thinking of? The i is the ranking of the. No, it is a multiplication. The number of the test to be tested. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Right. Okay. Sorry about that. So anyway, the point of this is that there are a range of different approaches you can do. Bonferroni is overly conservative. I've never actually really done a, to be honest, never really done a rigorous comparison of other false discovery rates and how it impacts on the data sets that we've generated. So that actually, that's you know, Stamp implements a lot of these. If you wanted to muck around with this in the tutorial on our Bumblebee data set, not our Bumblebee data set, the Bumblebee data set, then you could kind of test this for yourself and say, well, does it really make a difference in the number of significant results I get? OK, how about correlations? Any questions up till now? Yeah? So, so in the previous slide, you had 0.5 as your additive. Does it have a big impact on the number of results you get? Like, if you get 0.5 or 1, Something so that it's not zero. Does it matter? I guess have a big impact what that uh, is. Um, why did they choose 0.5? John, why did they choose 0.5? Quiet mode, yes. I mean, it's. I mean, it's smaller than any actual count you would get. That's a good question. So if you went from 0.5 to 5, for example, then how does it impact your sampling, right? I think that originates from uh, the distance regression where you're doing a logit transform, so you're avoiding divided by zero. So it's as effective as your situation for counts. OK, so splitting the difference between 0 and 1, basically. Okay. Well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you want it to be small relative to the observations. We're adding this count data, right? So it's it's going to be a really tiny amount relative to that. But if it changed by an order of magnitude, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, that's a very good question, actually. Um, that is good. <laughs> it's really good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's... <laughs> um, I don't know how long it's going to last, especially the... Um, oh, my God. So there's four flavors, right? And there's the, there's the cherry one, which is the best. There's the orange one, which is quite good as well. And then there's the... And I apologize if this has any induces any sort of physiological reaction, people. Mango. I learned that there was mango, and it actually made me kind of physically ill for a while because I just tried to imagine those things together, and like it wasn't working out well. And then I was in Sobeys, and I'm like, "Hey, they have the mango stuff. Let's try it." And actually, it was not as bad as it seemed. Um, I never bought it again, but it was not as bad as it seemed. <laughs> and then there's the really weird fourth flavor, which is what I can't remember. Guava? No, no, it's like it's not mint, but it's like some green herb thing. Plus, what's that? Ginger lime, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Someone got fired. Uh, so this is going up on the web. Maybe I'm getting fired. Um, so OK, what about coroxism? You've got a bunch of abundances of things. Again, 
ASVs, OTUs, don't use OTUs, species, functions, whatever. Um, and so what you want to think about now is what is the correlation structure among this, right? Maybe you want to consider all possible pairwise correlations so you can look at stuff that goes up together and stuff that goes down together, right? Because maybe, just maybe, there's some biological relevance to that. Again, causality eh, requires experimentation, but you know, the fact that two things go up together, they co-vary when one is up, the other's up, and other's down, and other's down, at least raises some interesting questions, right? So for example, maybe they are mutualists. Maybe they get along really well and one produces something that the other really likes to eat, and so that's why they go up together. Maybe with a tiny little lag, but that lag might be less than the resolution of your sampling. So maybe it takes an hour, you're sampling every day, so you're not going to see that. Um, or another possibility is that, you know, um, what's a good example? You take a person and they have a certain microflora and then you feed them, I don't know, what? Uh, crave cereal, um, something. And the conditions induced by whatever treatment favor both of those organisms independently. So it's not about them getting along together, it's just about the same ecological response, right? Um, either of these is interesting, right? You can't really tease apart these things, but if you know something about it, you can propose hypotheses and so on for later testing. And so, you know, we're thinking about ecological interactions, and there are terms, and this is, oh, by the way, Weiss et al. is this comprehensive test of many, many different correlation network inference methods. It's really good. You should read it. Uh, and so that, you know, they looked at the various uh, different types of models, right? So this is the example I gave you before. Plus and plus is mutualism. Uh, plus and nothing is commensalism, where one is uh, apathetic towards the presence of the other. Plus and minus is a negative interaction, right? If, if it's an interaction at all, right? Maybe it's not an interaction, but if it is, it is a negative one, right? Oh. Negative correlations between bacteriophages and the things that they love to kill, right? Which actually has some really, you know, important, interesting effects on dynamics in a lot of systems and is sometimes overlooked. And so you've got all of these, and you'd like to be able to infer these by looking at correlation networks. And so what's everyone's favorite on the next slide method? Well, we'll get to that. Uh, but the idea is here, compare, compute correlations between all pairs of entities and then threshold by some statistic or p-value to build the network, right? So you don't want to have a network that is completely connected because you can't do anything with that. You can't really interpret it visually. So you want to have some sort of threshold, right? Maybe the Pearson correlation is 0.3. Maybe the p-value is 0.01 or less. That's, that's the approach that you use to thresholding. All right, so the first correlation method that pretty much anyone learns is the Pearson approach. And essentially, it's looking at the covariance divided by the standard deviation, uh, and there are some assumptions based on it. Okay, and so it's it's quite intuitive. It's a parametric method that looks for things going up at the same time or things going down at the same time. You've also got the Spearman, which is applied to ranks, so it's less sensitive to outliers and things like that. Okay, but again, the correlation. I, I, I think it's fair to say that. The sensitivity to co of correlation measures to compositionality um, problems is awful, which may have driven this to be one of the first areas where compositional aware methods started to make inroads. Because if you do not address for compositionality, then you will have all sorts of spurious correlations all over the place. Okay? And so various methods were developed to try and deal with this in different ways. And one of the first ones, if not the first one published in 2012, is called SPARC. I always pronounce SPARC or SPARC or SPARS. Um, but the idea here is that, and, and one of the key assumptions of SPARC is that you've got lots of pairwise comparisons, but very few interesting correlations. Okay. That assumption is used to pave over some of the sort of param parameter related issues that I'm not going to get into. And the key here is something called Aitchison's test, which it's, it's, it's correlation based. The idea, not the implementation, but the idea is somewhat similar to ANOVA. It looks at um, 
the correlations among ratios of pairs of things, and it can say, by aggregating these, it can say, there's something here. There's enough of a deviation from some sort of null hypothesis that this is interesting. It will not tell you what is different from what else, and it will not tell you the magnitude of the effect size. Right? But this is your starting point. Right? And this was public. This was published in 1981, the first, the first version of the test. And so how do you infer statistical significance? You're like, OK, I've done n squared comparisons, right, or n choose 2 comparisons. And HSN test says there's something. Right? OK, great. Um, and so assess the statistical significance based on simulation of many variables with no correlation. Right? So this is like we're going to have a whole bunch of abundances that are not meaningful. But obviously, there's going to be some differences from zero, right? But what you hope to see is that the correlation between any pair of taxa um, is way bigger than most of your simulated null distributions, right? That is potentially indicative of something real. Does that make sense? Question? OK. But feel free to interrupt, because as I say, you know, if you have a question, you're guaranteed to not be the only person in the room with that question. So it also helps to wake people up. So. Once, OK. Um, so Spark, and, and here's, here's kind of where the rubber hits the road in this terms, right? <clears throat> this is a paper, this is a figure from the Spark paper. And what they did, they just, they had, they had real data, right? And this is very pixelated, but five different body sites, uh, mid-vagina, retroauricular retro crease, buccal mucosa, gut, super gingival plaque. And so each of the dots around the perimeter is a taxonomic group. I think it's OTUs. I believe it's OTUs. And green edges connect dots that have a statistically significant um, Pearson correlation. Right? A lot of edges. Um, and there's some red ones, which, which are like negative, significant negative correlations. Right? OK. Um, so then this is the real distribution. And you can simulate uh, data right, with similar structure, but no correlation in it. And this is what you get. So this is kind of nice in most cases. right? It's like, so let's look at super gingival plaque on the bottom. OK, we have this many connections. right? And our fake data has very few connections, which means that we expect relatively few statistically significant correlations by chance. So that's OK. But you know, look at the top there, right? Look at the top. And even under the fake data condition, you still have a lot of connections, right? And I believe that has a lot to do with the relatively low diversity of the vaginal microflora, right? It's dominated by various types of lactobacillus, right? Very different uh, diversity profile. And so you have different null distributions here. And then they ran Spark. And you can see quite clearly that you know, the impact of Spark relative to Pearson is really dependent on the type of data you're looking at. Right? And so this was validated on simulated data uh, and tested on real data, obviously. And once again, this is something I said earlier on, the impact of your choice of method really depends on the underlying structure in the data. So one thing that we like to do is, you know, this sort of <clears throat> uh, 19th century principle of concordance of evidence, right? Try it a few different ways and see whether the same type of result pops out, which is great, but make sure that those methods are not just doing the same thing in different ways, right? So, you know, great examples from phylogenetics, right? It's like, I built a tree. And it's got, you know, I built a tree using maximum likelihood with a Whalen and Goldman substitution model, right? And I got a tree and I got statistical support. I built a tree using maximum likelihood with a Jones Taylor Thornton model and got the same tree. Well, guess what? Those models are almost the same. The fact that you've got two trees that are very similar means nothing. So when you're testing this, make sure that if you're using different methods, make sure that the foundations of those methods are somewhat different. Right? And that's the nice thing about that Weiss 2016 paper, is that they really do give information about the contrast of the method, so that you can say, well, I don't want to try all nine, but I'm going to try two. And the two I try, I know, can give me different results. 
if they can and they don't on a particular data set, well, that's interesting. Make sense? And so just to make it a bit, I was going to say fun, but whatever. This is actually some of our data. This is data that we generated. This is from a study of 47 individuals in an assisted care facility. Uh, and what we had was um, 47 individuals, roughly four to five weekly time points for each individual. Uh, and so that was about 210 60S samples. So Mike and my group, who also designed this, this uh, B, the Bumblebee tutorial, applied certain statistical methods um, to generate these networks. And so what you're looking at here, it's kind of interesting. This is a correlation network of positively correlated OTUs generated using Spark. Um, the colors are phyla, right, for whatever phyla are worth. And the size of the nodes in the network is proportional to the overall abundance in the population. And so, you know, it's OTUs, so that's a fundamental limitation of this. But it's still interesting to look at it and see things like connections between, okay, where are you, where are you, where are you? Baruca microbia has some positive connection with itself, but also with firmicutes. And Baruca microbia are pretty much our favorite phylum because if you see Veruca microbia, that usually means Ackermansia, which if you've heard of that, is a very, very interesting bacterium that people are studying for probiotic potential. Right? It's a really, really neat organism. Mike has demonstrated that there's actually different types of it that all show different temporal properties, covariation. That's another story for a different day. Anyway, I thought it was pretty, so I included it. Okay. What time is it now? I'd like to go through this. It, mean, it means that it means that like you'll still have time to do some of the tutorial. You might encroach on the coffee break, but I, I, machine learning is fun and interesting. So bear with me. So it was a lie. I said we wouldn't get through the slide. I guess we didn't really get through the slide. So we've talked about statistics. Now let's think about machine learning. So it's an interesting sort of philosophical discussion. Is there a difference between statistics and machine learning? Terminology is a big part of it, right? And so there are methods that are quite similar between the two, right? Um, new version of Java is available. Can I just ignore that? I can't. Remind me later. OK. Do statistics have a monopoly on probability density functions, right? A NOVA, right? Normality, whatever. No. Lots of machine learning methods also exploit the fact that you have variables with probability distributions. Okay? So that's not really a differentiator. Is iterative training exclusive to machine learning? The idea here is that machine learning methods are big and fancy and complicated and therefore have no closed form solutions. What does that mean? It means that you cannot take most machine learning methods, say, here's the data, and the machine learning method immediately goes, okay, data, come in, model, go out. What typically happens with machine learning methods is, uh, and I'm just going to talk about, talk about supervised methods here, data go into machine learning method, support vector machine, random forest, artificial neural network, blah, blah, blah. And the machine learning method has, an, in, has a model inside it and it says, using this model, I predict this. Okay. Okay. And then you look at it, you look at the accuracy of the model, and you say, bad classifier. And the classifier goes back and says, okay, I'll try again. Some parameters get updated, and it gives a new accuracy score. Right? The idea being that if the training method is good over many iterations, the machine learning classifier will converge on the optimal solution. Okay, right? But that's, that's the idea. Is iterative training exclusive to machine learning? No. An ANOVA is not iterative. There's a closed form solution. Linear regression is not iterative. There's a closed form solution. But as you get to fancier and fancier statistical methods, then there are iterative procedures as well. Is machine learning alone concerned with predictive accuracy? No. Again, machine learning methods are usually evaluated in terms of the accuracy of the predictions they make, but that's true of some statistical methods as well. So I tend to be a bit nihilistic about this and not worry too much about the distinctions 
But it's certainly the case that when people think of machine learning, they typically think of far more complex models that are being fitted with many, many parameters, which creates great opportunities on complex data sets, but it also creates some pretty significant risks as well. So why use machine learning? Well, free parameters, right? So you can have these very, very, very non-parametric models that can fit different aspects of your data, right? An ANOVA has a parameter, right? That's all it can work with. Whereas a machine learning method can have all sorts of different parameter values that allow it to fit the training data beautifully, right? And so it has the capacity, right? If it's like these 15 things interact to, um, you know, determine the outcome of this, I'm pretending causality again, then the machine learning method potentially has the ability to discover those interactions and give you a model that does really well on the data overall. Of course, one problem of that is that the more parameters you have, the more opportunity you have to learn the data set exactly. Okay, and I'll give you an example of that in a moment. And the other thing to watch out for is that many machine learning methods are really complicated, and at some point with many methods it becomes magical. Right? Support vector machine. Data go in. Something's happening inside. And then predictions come out. Right? Your accuracy is really high, but actually determining what the support vector machine is doing, it's not impossible, but it's really difficult and it's completely non-intuitive. Some methods are more interpretable and some are hopeless. Um, different methods perform well on different types of data, right? Constoffel stands for? Bam, thank you, Larry Niven. There ain't no such thing as a freelance. Ooh, last one, good. I can actually get on the plane now. Um, so yeah, there's, there's no free lunch. That's actually the name of the theorem. Basically says that there is no single machine learning method that dominates across all classification problems. Okay? So where does that leave us? Well, things to keep in mind. There are a lot of different classifiers to consider, right? You can't use them all, um, but there are certain criteria you can use to think about these things. One is what's called the bias variance trade-off. And it's got a fancy name, but it's very simple. A classifier with high bias has very few parameters that it can fit. Therefore, it's not good at learning complicated things. That could actually be a good thing in many cases. If the problem is not that complicated, do not give an overly complicated classifier. Right? So that's bias. Variance is at the other end, where you know some gigantic artificial neural network has a million free parameters and can therefore fit the hell out of your training data, which can lead to overfitting. Right? Do you care about interpretability? Right? If you do, they use something like a decision tree. If you don't, there's lots of other methods to try. Do you want training to finish this decade? Right? And so there are examples of classifiers that scale horrifically on the data. Right? A support vector machine on 10,000 or 100,000 cases? Well, Unless there are variants that I'm not aware of that do well on that, I've never had any success at that scale. However, my student Donovan developed a method based on naive Bayes classification, which is very simple and fast, that he was able to train and test. I told him he was crazy and it wouldn't work, but it did. Train and test on all camers, all words of length 15. I was like, that's not even going to fit on the hard disk. That's like, you know, a ridiculously large data set, but it worked. It actually worked very quickly. So Naive Bayes, because of its simplifying assumptions, actually works really well in large data sets. Okay. Does anything about the problem suggest a particular choice of classifier? So that's, that's big and complicated, but already you know, we're sort of getting into this with these other bullet points there. So generalization. You've trained a classifier on a set of data. And as I said, you can overfit the data such that the classifier knows that data really well, those, those data really well, but when you show it something it hasn't seen before, it completely plotses because it hasn't learned the general rules that define the data, right? And so this is one of my favorite quotes that most people don't really like, but I use it anyway. A machine with too much capacity, read, 
a classifier with a high degree of variance, lots of free parameters, is like a botanist with a photographic memory who, when presented with a new tree, concludes that it is not a tree because it has a different number of leaves from anything she has seen before. Right? That's overfitting. A machine with too little capacity, read bias, is like the botanist's lazy brother who declares that if it's green, it's a tree. Neither can generalize well. So this is where you get into stuff, and this is where I might start jumping ahead a little bit. Long story short, you have data. Don't use all of the data to train the classifier. Use some of it to train. Test with other data sets that it hasn't seen before. And if it does well on the stuff that it hasn't seen before, then it's probably doing pretty well. Blah, 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 skipping ahead. Cross-validation is a fancy way of doing that. Uh, support vector machines. There's some really cool theory behind it. Here's, here's drawing a line that separates the blue category from the red category. There's different ways to do it. Support vector machines try to find the optimum way to do it. Uh, it's really cool. Sorry, <laughs> it's just got to stop somewhere. Um, SVMs. I'm not actually. I'm not even going to talk about linear separability. If you're interested in it, we can talk about it during the tutorial or afterwards. Uh, training is iterative, and interpretation is not a thing. Okay. Last thing. So this is a paper we published about three years ago. It's my PhD student Jesse and I, and we had a bunch of HMP data sets. This is a principal component plot. Okay. Nine different uh, oral microbiome sites, nine different oral cavity sites. Right? Apparently there are nine oral cavity sites. And so this is a uh, ordination plot of various samples from each of these, including 300 from supragingival plaque, which is like plaque above the gum line, and then 300 from subgingival plaque, which is below the gum line. And so the ordination plot tells you something that you could probably have guessed anyway. These things are really close to each other. They're both on the tooth. They're pretty hard to differentiate, right? You can sort of see some tendencies, like there's more green up here and more blue down there. And they're actually quite nicely separated from the rest of the oral sites. So we're like, here's an interesting example. Here's an interesting case. Right? So we decided to tackle this two-class problem. Data encoding is really, really, really important for classification. Right? There are many, many different ways to represent your data set. And so we're like, eh, I like biology. What can we come up with? So the first one was OTUs, right? Because that's like, you got to try OTUs. Uh, this was really before ASVs kind of took off. So we focused on OTUs. We also built phylogenetic trees of all of our sequences. And this is where I was talking before about, it's kind of like LEFC, right? The classifier can actually choose to have a really tight association of bacteria, like a really small clade in the tree as one of its differentiating features, or it can take a huge set of bacteria, like all of the proteobacteria, for example, to try and differentiate super from subgingival plaque. So the classifier has a lot of latitude to pick what it wants to use in the model. And long story short, the groups that the classifier really liked were this really swath, really wide swath of phylum bacteroidetes, uh, smaller subclades within the firmicutes, and some stuff within the actinobacteria, and no proteobacteria at all. Okay. And so even just with this sort of screening, this initial screening of the data, we start to get a sense of which things might be interesting and useful in differentiating these. Right? I should emphasize, we didn't really care about what body sites we were looking at. We just wanted a hard problem to try this out on. The other thing we tried actually was pie crust, right? We could take our 16S sequences and predict functional distribution. Right? So we tried that. And so, long story short, the performance of clades was a little bit better than OTUs. The thing about clades is that we had a lot of features we generated. And so without feature selection, we had a somewhat lower result. PyCrush functions really kind of uh, did not work very well. Right? And so 80% is like, the bane of bioinformatics classification. It's like we used a classifier in a data set, we got 80% accuracy. Unless, of course, you're using PSORT B, in which case you get much higher accuracy than 80%. Um, so, but there's a question here, and this is, I think, what I'm going to finish with. Right. So, we have two groups of samples. 
We've tried to classify, and we tried a whole bunch of other stuff that I haven't shown you. We've tried to classify, and our ceiling actually with clades was about 82%, depending on how we, how we ran it. But how good can you do? Is there some magic data encoding and method out there that can give you 100% accuracy? Probably not, right? Intuitively, it's probably not the case. Think about somebody sampling the subgingival plaque, right? Scrape. So, sorry, breaking things now. Um, and so here's what we did. And this comes back to something I said before. We said, all right, well, SVMs are a thing. Random forests are also a thing. And source tracker, which I don't have to explain, time to explain, is another thing again. And they are very different in the approaches they take to the data. So we had done the SVM and we had an accuracy profile across these. And now we tried random forest and we tried source tracker. Long story short, out of the 100% of our samples, 80% were relatively easy and most classifiers got up to 80%, close to it. 10% of the samples were never classified accurately, accurately by anything ever. So I would argue that we should just not even worry about them and say these are not... Uh... Okay. <laughs> um, I, I'm not going to ask. Um, and so these are the 10% of samples that are hopeless. Um, you're going to tell me that you have a classifier and you applied it to the same data set and got 100% accuracy, aren't you? Um, so 10% of samples, so maybe our ceiling of accuracy is 90%. Now we didn't get anything close to 90%. Well, we combined the classifiers together and said, well, maybe each classifier can give us, you know, if we combine the predictions, maybe we can get 90%. So we tried it, we got 80%. So that was pretty much the end of that. Okay. Long story short, microbial data are hard and all methods have limitations. The end.